Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring meditation. With me is Stephen Schwartz, who has been a daily meditator for many decades. He is the author of many books, including The Secret Vaults of Time, The Alexandria Project, The Eight Laws of Change, How to Become an Agent for Personal and Social Transformation, and Opening to the Infinite. Stephen is a parapsychology researcher, an anthropological researcher, and uh, a, uh, an interdisciplinary scholar. Welcome, Stephen. Pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, our discussion on meditation was inspired really by an earlier conversation we had that meditators are better remote viewers. Yeah, so that's that's one of many reasons to meditate. <laughs> it's one of many. Yes, I, you know, what I say to people, I believe it. I mean, I look at it in my own life. Is the greatest <laughs> gift you can give yourself is to develop the daily practice of meditation. I can think of nothing else, man or woman, that you can do to improve your life than to develop the daily practice of meditation. 20 minutes a day will change your life in ways that you can hardly imagine. And if you look at the research literature, you know, there's the last time I looked, there was something in PubMed, the National Medical Library. Mm -hmm. There was something like 1,300 physiological papers, just changes in your body. Mm -hmm. Uh, meditators, 20 minutes of meditation a day will reduce the thinning of the prefrontal cortex and the brain stem that occur in aging, so it has a positive effect on your ability to hold your mental abilities as you age. It will give you uh, better resistance, it improves your immune system. It uh, increases your ability to concentrate. Uh, your sleep will be better. Your general health will improve. You'll have a better sex life. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. And, and more than that, it has huge social implications. Mm -hmm. For instance, in San Francisco, the four worst schools in San Francisco, by worst I mean highest dropout rate, most violence, all of all everything you th would think by worst. Yeah. These are kids who grow up in violent, low income, conflicted circumstances, uh, and they were having a lot of trouble in the schools, and they instituted a 20 minute a day meditation program. Mm -hmm. And uh, not a religious program, and I think it's very important from the beginning that we separate we can say many religions teach about meditation, but you can do meditation with no religious context at all. In any case, we, I mean, much of it today in, in medicine, we call it mindfulness. Yes. Um, or I believe Benson Herbert wrote a book many years ago called The Relaxation Response. Yes, Herbert Benson. Herbert Benson. Yeah, right. Harvard. I confuse them because there's a Benson Herbert who was a researcher in parapsychology. That's right. <laughs> but in any case, so they taught these kids a simple mindfulness mm -hmm. meditation technique, yeah. 20 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And and the students, they thought, well, they'd never sit still for it, that yeah. they would be too antsy. And no, in fact, as it went along, the students embraced it. And a couple of times when they didn't do it because something else was on, the students complained. Mm. But the net effect was that dropouts decreased enormously, graduation rates increased, school violence decreased, violence with these children, even in their neighborhoods, decreased, their lives generally improved, their study habits improved, their grades went up, 
And this was teaching them 20 minutes of a relaxation, mindfulness, meditation technique. So this has not only individual implications, but it has really significant, objectively measurable. These are, this is not conjecture or speculation, mm -hmm. social outcome measurements. Um, it's easy to learn. The research suggests really that it's much less important which technique you use because all of them are essentially ritual behavior. What matters is that you, be, you develop the ability to attain and sustain intention-focused awareness. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, in the parapsychological world, we see that meditators do better at non-local perce perception tasks yeah. than, than non-meditators. But much more importantly, I think, because not everybody wants yeah. to be a remote viewer, is that meditation, in addition to its physiological benefits, which are many, changes your whole psychology of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole way you look at the world, the way you interact with people, it has an effect on your relationships. The key, the key is not to become involved with a, a kind of sectarianism where you think this way of meditating is the only way. Mm -hmm. Because the research, as I say, suggests that what really matters is that you have this daily practice mm -hmm. where you are basically allowing the cognitive activity of your mind to calm and you allow yourself to relax. Now your blood pressure goes down, your stress levels go down, all these physical things I yeah. was mentioning are happening, but also, um, your capacity to cope with stress goes up. There just isn't anything else that I know of that an individual can do, independent of money, social position, race, educational level, any of these external definers. Mm -hmm. There is just nothing else that you can do that will improve your life than developing the daily practice of meditation. Now, I do know a few people who have negative experiences meditating. Uh, one person, for instance, tells me when they try to meditate, they have dark thoughts. Oh, Another yes. person, well, in, in the transcendental uh, meditation uh, culture, there's this, they use the phrase unstressing, that when you meditate, uh, you let go of stress, and in the process of letting go, it's stressful itself from time to time. Yes, that's my problem with a lot of the various schools of meditation are, A, they tell you this is the only way to do it, yeah. or the best way, mm -hmm. uh, and two, they get caught up in the ritual behavior, and they believe that the ritual behavior is the key, mm -hmm. not just a part of the process. Yeah. And so being, being non-stressed is very stressful. Mm -hmm. I, my approach to meditation, which is developed out of the research, not out of any religious yeah. uh, orientation, is basically uh, to develop this technique for attaining and sustaining intention-focused awareness. And I have, uh, well, perhaps it's worth saying it. Yeah. Um, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. And this is the way I teach it, and I've taught thousands of people to do this. Um, first of all, start with uh, the place. Mm -hmm. You want to pick your place where you're going to do it. Now, at one level, that's just a way of reinforcing, but as we have discussed in other interviews, there is also something that happens to the informational mm -hmm. architecture of the space. You so create a sacred space you for create yourself. create sacred space, exactly. So you pick your place. You pick your time. I happen to meditate at night. Mm -hmm. uh, other people like to do it early in the morning. It, the truth is, it doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. that you are consistent. So pick your place, pick your space. Next thing, pick your central phrase. And your central phrase could be a mantra. And there are reasons for using mantras because the reiteration of, of uh, uh, sound sequences um, produces a numinous effect, a numinosity effect, mm -hmm. because people have been doing it for thousands of years yes. or hundreds, whatever. 
Um, so you pick your central phrase, but it could also be a poem, a line out of a poem, a line out of a song. It could be a bumper sticker. It doesn't matter. What you want is something that expresses your sense of yourself where you are and at the same time your aspiration for where you would like to be. Uh -huh. So um, uh, you might start with uh, be still and know that all is one. Mm. I just made that up. <laughs> um, Not bad. <laughs> but the point being that I feel disconnected. I feel lonely. I feel cut off. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm appreciated. I, I, all of those kinds of things. But you want it to have meaning as opposed to, say, a, a mantra like yes. Om. Yes. Because uh, it's not that, as I say, mantras are uh, very good. But the, the thing is, that many, we, we associate meditation with the East. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, there have been techniques of meditation in every culture of humanity forever. Yeah. And, and when, when other people were saying mantras in, for instance, in, in uh, uh, another language, many other people understood the language. Mm -hmm. So it was, be still and know that all is one. I don't know what that would be if you translated it into uh, Urdu or something, but yeah. but um, you know, just because a mantra comes from another culture doesn't mean that that that's the optimal thing for you to do. I, I prefer people to understand what they're doing, mm -hmm. and so you pick a central phrase. Okay, and we'll in this instance say, "Be still and know that all is one." Okay. Then you pick four words or small phrases, just a couple of words, a single word or a multiple words, a physical word, an emotional word, a mental word, and a spiritual word. So you have four words. Mm -hmm. And just for the illustration, let's say that you have a chronic problem with overeating. And so your conception of yourself in your present situation is, I eat too much. Mm. When I get stressed, I compulsively eat, yeah. as an example. Okay. And so what I aspire to is that I will use food correctly. Mm. So your physical word might be food. Mm -hmm. You have a mental word. And I make a difference between a mental and emotional word because I have learned over the years that if you say to people, well, what do you think about that? They'll say, well, I feel. Mm -hmm. Or if you say, well, how do you feel about that? Well, I think. Yeah. So mental, emotional separation. So let's say that your, uh, that, uh, uh, your mental word is um, uh, concentration. Mm -hmm. I feel like my mind is a flipperty gibbet. I just can't seem to stay focused on anything. Um, I just, I, you know, what I really want to be able to do is to, is to think something through clearly and, and really stay focused on it. And so, let's say that your word would be focus. Mm -hmm. Your emotional word might be, I would like to feel um, that I am uh, recognized and, 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 and people see me for who I am mm -hmm. and that they see me clear, uh, clearly. Okay. And, and I would like to have, I would like to not always be constantly driven by the emotions that, that upset me. I'd like to have clarity. Mm -hmm. And so this emotional word would be clarity. Good one. And, and then for your spiritual word, uh, you might, you might, for instance, say, well, you know, I, I went to church when I was a child, and uh, but I just, I never really had any sense that I was a part of any greater thing or, or uh, that, that there was any sort of oneness or mm -hmm. anything like that. And, and so I would, you know, what I really long for is to feel a sense of connection. Uh -huh. And so your word might be connection. Okay. All right. So now you have four, you have your central phrase, mm -hmm. your physical word, your mental word, your emotional word, your spiritual word. Okay, so five items. Five items. Mm -hmm. You have your place, you have your time. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're going to discover when you do this is that this place that you've picked because it's very quiet, that suddenly 
it'll become very crowded. <laughs> and the time that you pick that you thought, well, I can do it this time, that it'll suddenly become complicated because the robotic behaviors that the unconscious robotic patterns of behavior, they don't want to be reclaimed. And they fight back. Mm -hmm. And so... Which is why people get restless sometimes exactly. when they meditate. Exactly. And mm -hmm. why they... Suddenly I'm filled with dark thoughts. So there you are. You have your place. You have your time. You have your central phrase. You have your words. You're sitting. You can sit. Don't lie down because you'll fall asleep because most people don't get enough sleep. And whenever they actually stop, they tend to fall asleep. Yeah. So it's better to be seated but you don't have to sit in a particular uh, posture. Mm -hmm. If you like a particular posture, sit mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. And there are subtle nuances that, that suggest that certain postures or hand mudras, hand configurations. Yes. But that's all, that's like saying, um, you know, uh, I, I'm uh, Michael Jordan and I'm worried about whether my uh, hands are holding the ball. I mean, you, when you get to that level of subtlety that you yeah. deal with that. Mm -hmm. so we just keep it very straightforward. Yeah. So you sit there, you sit for your 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You say your phrase. You want to be erect the way you erect, are. You're, sitting you're, you're, in a chair, comfortable. Your, otherwise, Your spine is straight. Yes, your spine is straight. You're sitting comfortably in a chair. Your feet are on the floor. Your in a comfortable position, and you sit there, you close your eyes, you take a deep breath, you let it out, mm -hmm. you take a deep breath, you let it out, you take a deep breath, you let it out, and as you do that, you feel your mind calming. It's like a still pool in the forest. Mm -hmm. And you say your phrase, be still and know that all is one. You say it again. Be still and know that all is one. You say it a third time. Be still and know that all is one. And then you stop. And for a while, there will be nothing. But after a little while, for most Westerners particularly, and this is a meditation for modern minds, yes. after a little while, thoughts will begin to bubble up. When they bubble up, if they relate to your central phrase, you think them. If they don't relate to your central phrase, you stop, you take a deep breath, and you say your phrase again mm -hmm. once or twice. Mm -hmm. And then you stop. There will be nothing. After a while, things will bubble up. If they relate to the phrase, you stop mm -hmm. and, and uh, you think them. If they, When they begin to wonder, oh, I'm going to have to go to that dinner party, and blah, 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 you stop. You say it again. Mm -hmm. You do that through the course. Now, what will happen over time is that some days you'll have to do that a number of times, and other days you may only have to do it once or twice. Mm -hmm. And at the end of your meditation, closing of the 20 minutes, you picture yourself and you say first your physical phrase, food. And you feel, you don't think, you just feel that what the, both that your recognition of where you are and your aspirational uh, uh, asp uh, uh, concept of yourself. I'm going to be in control of my food. Food. You just say that. Mm -hmm. Food. You can picture it arcing out if you want, and then your next word, and then your next word, mm -hmm. and your next word. Mm -hmm. Now, what will happen over time is that a word will go flat. And you'll understand what that means. It, it will lose its its emotional attachment, its numinous quality. Mm -hmm. And when you look at your life, you'll suddenly realize, oh my goodness, I'm no longer eating compulsively. Mm. You haven't struggled with it. You're, you, ca you cannot wrestle with the robots. In, in other words, you mean after a period of time of, of weeks of meditating? Oh, it could or, be weeks, months, could be years. But not minutes during no, no, the no, meditation. No, no, no. no. You, you do your meditation every day, yeah. your central phrase and your, your mm -hmm. physical, your mental, emotional, yeah. spiritual words. Uh, no, after a period of time, the word will go flat. Yes. And however long that takes mm -hmm. is however long it takes. But what will happen is when you look at your life, you will realize without even struggling or without even consciously intending to do it, that your whole habit patterns have changed. Mm -hmm. 
You know, there's whole schools of psychology about wrestling with the robots. Yeah. Well, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is simply to dissolve the robots, as it were, mm -hmm. by holding a different intention. Yeah. And when that happens, then you come up with a new word. Mm -hmm. Now, they won't necessarily go uh, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. Maybe the, maybe the mental word will go flat first. And then you'll realize, oh my goodness, I'm able to focus. I'm thinking much more clearly. It just kind of happened. And over time, even your central phrase will go flat. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, I've been, I've been a daily meditator since 1964. So, half a century, basically. Mm -hmm. And my central phrase, I developed this technique about five or six years into meditating when I began doing a lot of research on it. My central phrase has gone flat four times mm -hmm. in 50 years. Mm -hmm. My uh, individual power words, uh, I've changed a number of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have changed my entire life, in fact, mm -hmm. my entire life has changed from who I was pre-meditating to who I am today. Mm -hmm. And most of it has occurred without any particular conscious attention to it. I eat differently, I, I, I focus, I'm able to accomplish things. You know, I get a lot of stuff done. You you do. So for people who say they don't have time to meditate, you're a, a great example of how somehow taking the time to meditate creates more time. Absolutely. You know, I, I've, I've published uh, something like 150 papers. I've written five books. I do the Daily Schwartz Report. I write my column. I write stuff for things like the Huffington Post or Smithsonian. You're out on the speaking circuit. I, I speak, I, all kinds of yeah. things. You make movies. I make movies. <laughs> I just wrote a novel. Um, and a screenplay. <laughs> and a screenplay. Um, the point being, that it's not, I'm not doing anything that anybody can't do. Mm -hmm. the, the, the point that I want to mm -hmm. leave you with is that this simple technique of these words of power and your central phrase, mm -hmm. and this simple little process of sitting for 20 minutes a day will literally alter your life in a life-affirming, compassionate way that you can hardly imagine. And I just don't know anything else that will do that. Well, you've really been at it uh, in, in a disciplined way. I can say for myself, I am uh, I'm happy with uh, the way things have worked out, but I would be what I call an undisciplined meditator. <laughs> I, I meditate when and where I feel like it. Well, and, and you'll get to that. Uh -huh. But the problem is you have to convince yourself you're serious. Yeah. The, 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 the process of meditation is a process of self-exploration. Mm -hmm. And so, just for starters, the reason you pick the place, I mean, I meditate all over the place. Yeah. But the reason you start with the place and the time, and mm -hmm. I also, although I meditate at night uh, because my wife and I meditate and then she goes to bed and I go mm -hmm. back to work. Mm -hmm. But um, the point for doing that initially yeah. is you have to convince yourself that you're not BSing yourself mm -hmm. because you've had lots of things, not you, but one, we, we all do, oh, I'm going to make this commitment, yeah. I'm going to make my New Year's resolution, yeah. but I, I'm not going to take it real seriously. So first of all, you have to convince yourself that you're serious about what you're mm -hmm. doing. Yeah. And if you will do this, as, as I say, the, the benefits that arise from mm -hmm. this are so extraordinary. Well, I don't hold myself up as a role model, I can say that. Well, no, yeah. no, but you are a regular meditator, and, mm -hmm. and I, I'm i sure yeah. you would say it's made a big difference in your life. Absolutely. I uh, totally subscribe to everything you've said about meditation and its benefits. Yeah, I mean, and, and it doesn't have to be done, in, it doesn't have to be a religious context. There is no one way to meditate. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no magic bullet about yeah. it. Uh, there's... All uh, people get hung up in the ritual behavior. Yes, it's you know we've talked about remote viewing in these interviews, and you know there are people that this is the only way to remote view. There are cults. Yeah, that's a cult. 
Mm-hmm. That's right. The truth is, it's all ritual behavior mm-hmm. to allow you to open to the non-local aspect mm-hmm. of your consciousness. Well, one of the interesting things, and, and I think uh, you're familiar with this too, is the uh, one meditation organization claims that the more people who meditate, the better all sorts of social indicators uh, in the environment improve. Yes, I, ac- rates and so I on. actually tried to do a study on that. Uh-huh. You know, there there was a group, uh, maybe we shouldn't name them, but they claim that if you got a group of meditators, you could lower the crime rate. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. And they published a couple of papers Many on papers. It. Yeah. Dozens. Yeah. So I thought, well, that really, gosh, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. So I went down, a friend of mine was a deputy chief of police in Los Angeles, yeah. and I got the Los Angeles Police Department to go along with it and to give me, they, they, they happened to have an extraordinarily sophisticated data collection mm-hmm. system yeah. and, and database. Mm-hmm. So they can tell you at three o'clock in the morning at, at 3842 Walnut Street, uh, the probability that a crime will occur. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really amazingly sophisticated. Mm-hmm. So I went down to talk to them and a guy named Marty Riser, who in those days was the head of the of this biometric uh, yes. department. Mm-hmm. I know who he is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he said, well, just for starters, Stephen, do you know about the Kansas window study? No. He said, well, we know that if you break a window in a building in a neighborhood and nobody repairs it, after three weeks, crime will go up. Mm -hmm. Or, he said, there's the black and white study. I said, what's that? He said, well, if one more black and white patrol car goes through a neighborhood, crime will go down. And as I got further and further into this with him, I realized that when you try to do a study like that, Mm -hmm. really rigorously, that there's simply so many variables you can't control Mm -hmm. that you really, I I, I didn't actually do the study because by the time I had spent three or four months uh, going through their data and and talking with the people uh, in the department, I realized there was no possible way. He said, let me, I mean, I tried to solve all these problems. He said to me, you know, just driving your meditators into the neighborhood will change the crime rate. Mm. I said, well, suppose I masquerade them as cleaners into an office building. <laughs> he said, do you think the people that are crooks won't learn that they aren't actually the cleaners? <laughs> do you think they're not going to talk to the cleaners because they, they don't do any research before they break into the office building? Hmm. Oh, no, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. He said, you can't introduce a variable into a neighborhood without causing changes. Mm -hmm. And so I would say this, there is no question that if you get large numbers of people to meditate that there is a massive change because there is a change at the individual level, the beingness of the people change. Yes. And when the beingness of individuals change, it's like the quotidian choice thing we discussed, when the beingness of the individuals change, the social Mm-hmm. consciousness changes. And so I am sure, conceptually, that if you got a gr- enough people in an area to meditate together, that it would alter the, mm-hmm. the social patterns of that area. Mm-hmm. But trying to design a study that would really withstand rigorous examination, uh, that where you controlled all the variables that could mm-hmm. have an effect, I just found, I mean, maybe with a huge amount of money you could do it, but but I, at the end of the day, having put almost a year by the time mm-hmm. it was over, having put almost a year into trying to design mm-hmm. an experiment to, to see whether this proposition worked, I had I, I just had to give up because yeah. I I simply couldn't um, I couldn't control all and, the variables. And uh, and of course, one of the you know, first. Uh, things to be suspicious of in any research is is when an organization does research for the purpose of promoting themselves. Yes. That's, that's whether it's a commercial organization or yes. a religious organization. Absolutely. That, that is always immediately suspect. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at, for instance, the therapeutic intention, healing research, yeah. um, Wayne Jonas, the president of Samueli Institute, did all of that. And the lowest 
rating for um, quality of research was uh, religious research, which basically started with a conclusion and then designed an experiment to validate the conclusion. Mm -hmm. You have to start with a hypothesis and test the hypothesis, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. So it's very difficult to do that social level at that detail. But I think it is quite clear, and again, we've discussed Roger Nelson's Global Consciousness Project, where you have large masses of people who hold intention-focused awareness for a moment about something, you cause a change in social mm -hmm. structure. And we have the power to change our personal beingness and in the change of our own personal beingness to change the world. A good there. reason to encourage everybody to find a way to meditate that works for them. Absolutely. Stephen Schwartz, thank you so much for sharing this with me. Glad to. Very important conversation. Thanks. And thank you for being with us.